Right, so the reason for the handout is that, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about today is Kaluza Klein theory, which is a particular method of hiding extra dimensions. And so we're going to look at the actual theory of Kaluza and Klein. And there's, you know, one of these computations in there. So again, rather than have you worrying about getting details down, the handout's there, so you know you've got it. Um, so really what kaluza klein theory does is it extracts four-dimensional gravity out of a higher dimensional action. And so at the time, clearly, uh, there was no sort of real experimental reason for Kaluza to have developed this theory. I think it was about 1920. And indeed, I think Einstein sat on the paper for some considerable period of time because I, I don't know whether he didn't believe it or whether he just wasn't convinced about it. But in any case, as we will see, it's actually, from a mathematical perspective, it's, it's a really sort of beautiful idea in which we get not only four-dimensional gravity, but also something that is like four-dimensional Einstein-Maxwell theory from pure geometry. And so from a modern perspective, we would say that the U1 gauge, theory, you know, gauge group of electromagnetism is realized geometrically by adding uh, an additional circle to space-time. Now, we'll also see that there's other things that are maybe not so helpful, but you know, coming out of the theory, but it's, a, it's an extremely good illustration of you know, how to hide extra dimensions uh, of unification, because it gives us not just gravity, but also another massless, uh, well, the only other massless field that we've got. Um, but it, it comes at a price. It gives us another force as well. So, until about 15 years ago, it was the only way in which we believed we could hide extra dimensions. That's another reason for its sort of predominance in gravity theory. I should stress this is going to be viewed as a low energy limit. So this is something where the lightest degrees of freedom are like four-dimensional gravity, but we could imagine that there'll also be um, other degrees of freedom. But in Kaluza, you know, in the sort of Kaluza Klein model, the idea is that they are of such high energy, they're not relevant. So this carries along with it a notion that the extra dimensions or dimension are small. So this is where this phrase compactification comes from. We're imagining they're small and compact. And the other thing that we will do when we look at the low energy effective action is we're going to assume that the geometry does not depend on the extra dimension. So it's, that, I guess, is the key feature of Kaluza Klein theory. It's saying you've got extra dimensions, but they're so small that there are, we don't see any degrees of freedom associated with them. There's no dependence of the geometry on this internal set of dimensions. So let's actually go ahead and take a look. So we're going to start with a five-dimensional geometry, and we're going to look at turning it into a four-dimensional theory. So we can see intuitively 
that what we want to do is we've got a sort of g mu nu embedded in there, so a four-dimensional metric. Tilder it. And then we've got our fifth dimension. So we've got like a G55 and then cross terms G5 mu. So we could parameterize our G55 as a scalar. So remember, everything is going to depend on X and not on our extra dimension which we'll call psi, but then we choose, rather than saying we're going to take g mu nu, g mu 5, and g 5 5 as our degrees of freedom, we kind of complete a square with the fifth dimension. So the reason that we do this is so that the square root of the metric, determinant of the metric, is just e to the sigma root g tilde. So we are peeling off extra dimensions in such a way that this thing really is a four-dimensional scalar. Well, it's, that's not hard, and that being a four-dimensional vector is not hard. But it's really trying to peel it off, so this is a four-dimensional tensor. So we're kind of trying to explicitly, up front, get the degrees of freedom correct. So that's why we... We do it in this particular way, and we're assuming that this uh, psi here is a small circle. And of course, because we said that the geometry was independent of psi, d by d psi is a killing vector. So that's our assumption. Our assumption is... We've got a five-dimensional metric dependent on only four of the, the, the dimensions. And we choose to split our degrees of freedom into a convenient fashion. So here we've got G5 is root G tilde e to the sigma. Right. So let's go ahead and just compute the curvature of this metric and see what the five-dimensional Einstein action actually looks like. So the fact that we've chosen to call our G5 mu A mu is fairly indicative. We're going to expect something that looks like the Maxwell field strength, but let's find it. And so, you know, we're going to do the same sort of thing as we did with that, uh, those building blocks warp metric. So, as always, we pick an orthonormal basis for G tilde, and then we pick our omega 5, or omega psi, to be the obvious thing. Okay, so we do, do our usual differentiation. D omega A is fairly straightforward. You're just taking the, the derivative of that uh, Fierbein. And so that's simply going to be whatever uh, the background connection is for G tilde. And then D of omega psi. Well, we're going to take a derivative of e to the sigma. So we're going to get something that looks like sigma comma a omega a cross omega psi. And then the other piece we get is the derivative of 
A. So that's e to the sigma dA, which is, of course, F. So the connection is where we start seeing the Maxwell stress tensor coming in. And now we know that this should be equal to uh, minus theta AB cross omega B minus theta A psi cross omega psi. So I'm just writing that down. So the reason is this is the sort of first example where sort of unraveling the connection coefficients is not just a simple matter of picking them out of the right-hand side. So the theta psi A pieces are fairly easy to see. So to pick out those, you see you've got to just directly get the derivative of sigma. That goes straight down. And then for this piece, you can see here that this term is just a half e to the sigma uh, FAB omega A cross omega B. So you can see that you've got to have an FAB omega B there. But now, if I look at what that means for theta AB, well, obviously, I've got the background, theta. That's always there. But in this expression, I also get a term co contributing from here with an f. So I have to subtract that off by having a term in here. So I need to have an omega psi piece as well. So it's reasonably straightforward to pick off what's going on, but it's just, you, you know, it's the first time we've seen it where it's not just a completely direct um, case of reading off the connection. So that means we're going to have, you know, a few terms to keep track of when we calculate the curvature tensor. So we need to take D of theta AB and then we've got to get all the cross terms and there's quite a few cross terms in here. Okay, so like I said, there are a lot of terms to keep track of, but we know that the curvature two form is d theta plus theta wedge theta. The first two pieces come from d theta AB here. The rest of the top line comes from theta AC wedge theta CB, and the second line comes from theta A psi wedge theta psi B. So I've just literally written down where those pieces came from. Okay, so <clears throat> I've got my work cut out for me here.
OK, so sorry I ran out of board there, but that top line is d of theta a, b. So when I take this d here, I've got three pieces, OK? So that's where each of those terms come from. And then I've just got to get these cross terms. So here's what we would expect. We'd expect a piece that's going to give us the background curvature of G tilde. And then I've got another two cross terms, because obviously the omega psi cross omega psi is 0. So here we've got uh, So that's the cross terms from the theta AB, the top line. And then the bottom line has a very promising looking term. It's got FF in it. And then I've got two uh, cross terms again. Okay, so that's the worst done. Um, what I'm going to do, rather than spend you know a lot of time manipulating this into a, a, a you know more friendly format, is it ultimately what we're interested in is thinking about Einstein equations and the Ricci scalar. So all we really need are components of the Riemann tensor that are going to contribute to the Ricci. So what that means is if I have two four-dimensional indices here, I'm looking really for two four-dimensional indices on the right-hand side. So things like this term, those are obviously purely lying within the four-dimensional space. This is a cross term. That's a cross term. That's a cross term, but this isn't. We've got F there, which is four-dimensional. Here, that's a cross term. Uh, this is another cross term. And then on the bottom line here, we've got something again lying within the four-dimensional space. That's a cross term, and that's a cross term. So although there's a lot more going on, in fact, all I'm really interested in are the pieces that I've underlined in green. So that's what we'll sort of pull and focus in on. <clears throat> so these are going to give me contributions to the purely four-dimensional Riemann. So Riemann with its indices lying exclusively in the four-dimensional space. So you can see that these two terms on the top line and here are just the background Riemann tensor. So I can just peel that off. Um, and then all I'm left with is this term and that term up there, both of which involve FF pieces. So you can see that we've got e to the 2 sigma for each of those. Now here, I've got FAC, FBD, but I've got to make sure that it has the right symmetries, so I anti-symmetrize in C and D. And then the other piece here, F, is already anti-symmetric in C and D. So I just pull that one straight out. So that's my uh, Riemann tensor lying exclusively within the four-dimensional space. And it looks 
very promising, considering what I advertised at the beginning of the lecture, in that it's got a four-dimensional gravity piece and an FF term. So next, let's get the rest of the Riemann tensor. So that's going to be D of theta psi A. is that term. And then it's going to have a cross term, which is going to be theta psi b, cross theta b a. what that piece looks like. So I'm just going to go through once again and do all the manipulations I need to do. So here's taking D of the first term, it hits the scalar, we've got a second derivative of the scalar. Then it's going to hit the omega psi, and I've calculated D omega psi up there. It's uh, That's another one with an F term in it. Then I've got to take D of this piece. Sorry, I decided to go along the bottom of the board thinking I'd have enough space, and I'm not quite sure I'm going to manage. Um, so that's all just D of that first term, and now I've got to take these cross terms. Okay, with apologies for how scrunched up it's become. So there's a lot going on in there. This first sort of two, three bits are taking the derivative, and these three bits come from the cross terms. But once again, we're only going to be interested in the pieces that are going to contribute to the Ricci tensor. So in this case, we've got... Uh, a cross piece, five, something f from the fifth dimension and the four dimensional indices. So on the right hand side, we need to pick out the terms that have an omega b, omega psi piece in them. So the first one's something that we need. Here's another one that's something that we need. We don't need this one. We don't need that one. We don't need that one. We don't need that one. We do need this one. Um, we don't need that one. And we do need that one. So, again, although it looks quite intimidating, when you actually pull apart <clears throat> what you need, there's much 
much less going on there. So if I extract the piece I need, So here I can see that I've got a sigma comma a b term. So that's the first term. The second term I can see is consists of first derivatives of sigma. So I get just two first derivatives of sigma. So then I've got to come all the way over here, and here I see I've got a sigma with a connection. So that's um, going to give me actually a connection component, because that's from the definition of the connection one forms. And then my final piece, you can see I've got a quarter e to the 2 sigma, and then again I've got, if I rearrange it, I've got an FF term. So in this case, what I actually need is this set of Riemann components and that set of Riemann components. So if I put these together and get my Ricci tensor, the Psi, Psi one's very easy because it's only that last line that contributes to it. And then for, <clears throat> for the RAB, I've actually got to take both of the Riemanns, sum over both Riemanns. So, pulling all that together, you can see that I've got, I've sort of got the background Ricci tensor kind of hiding away in there. I've also got the scalar field. Now, the scalar field was what multiplied the extra dimension. So, it's looking like we're picking up an extra degree of freedom. And we didn't really see that until, you know, we got down to actually calculating this curvature. I mean, we had hints at the connection level, but we're only really seeing it now. And it's coming from the parts of the curvature involving the extra dimension, so that kind of makes sense, whereas our f degrees of freedom, well, they're coming from both, obviously, but you can see that, you know, they're sort of sitting here as well in this four-dimensional Riemann curvature. So our Ricci scalar... has, now we see, our real degrees of freedom. And I'm going to just express the scalar part slightly differently, so it looks like a total derivative. But we can now see in our Einstein-Hilbert action how we're going to get general relativity or something like it, how we're going to get electromagnetism, but we also see we've got a degree of freedom corresponding to the internal uh, dimension. And that's not a degree of freedom that depends on the internal dimension. It really is a genuine sort of, we call it sometimes a breathing mode. It's something that tells us how big 
the extra dimension is. So the, the size of the extra dimension can vary throughout space-time. <clears throat> so our five-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert action which would just be, I mean, boundary terms. I'm, I'm not considering boundary terms here because they're not really relevant for this particular discussion. It would just be root G R. Now we've worked out how to uh, calculate that. And as I said right back at the beginning, the way we've written the metric means that our square root of the determinant is just a nice product of the size of the internal dimension times root g tilde. And so we simply get a nice root, you know, d4x root g tilde here. But we've also got this e to the sigma. Now, if I just write r tilde to emphasize that this Ricci tensor comes from g tilde, Now, I'm going to argue, again, this is uh, a total derivative, because we, this is why I wrote it like this. There's an e to the minus sigma here, an e to the plus sigma there, so it goes. Um, so you might think that this really is Einstein-Maxwell theory, because it just has Ricci and f squared. But that's not quite true, because, of course, what we've got is this extra term. So this is now something different from what we've seen before. So it's almost four-dimensional gravity, but not quite. Our Ricci tensor is multiplied by a scalar. So this is known as uh, scalar tensor gravity. And it really only began to be properly explored in the late 50s and 60s by Jordan, Brands, and Dickey. So at the time with Kaluza and, and Klein, they, they sort of realized the scalar was possibly an issue, and so simply you know, sort of imposed that it was a constant. Which, you know, okay, there's been this no, I mean, this is one of the reasons I think Kaluza Klein theory was regarded as one of these mathematical curiosities because there was no physical reason to actually dynamically maintain the fact that this internal dimension was constant. And indeed, if you start looking at how, if you try and add matter to this five dimensional action, you will see that the size of the internal dimension does indeed couple. <laughs> to whatever matter you put into four dimensions. And so, well, it's a scalar. It's sort of obvious it's going to couple to kind of the trace of energy momentum. And so it will indeed, in the end, end up gravitating and, and changing in any sensible configuration. So that's, that's kind of you know, why Kaluza-Klein theory was um, not really... You know, something that was considered that relevant for some time. Now, we could just leave it like this. And of course, with all the tools we've got, we're actually completely happy working in this uh, particular frame where we know how to vary the Ricci tensor. We've done that using the Palatini lemma previously. Uh, you know, um, the terms involving the second derivative of delta G integrated out. This time they won't. They're going to give us derivatives of sigma. So that's why sigma comes into the Einstein equations. But what I want to now just discuss is an alternative to doing that, where we actually change our definition of distance on our four-dimensional manifold in order to make the action look like the Einstein action. So this, this frame... Um,
So this is called a conformal transformation or a change of frame. And again, this is a sort of relativist's conformal transformation. And so we say that our uh, G tilde, which was the metric that we started out with, is going to be equal to some factor, position-dependent factor, times another metric. So we're rescaling what we mean by lengths. It doesn't change angles. So we call this, our original frame, is usually called the Jordan frame, because it was Jordan who explored this, and this G we call the Einstein frame. Because that's the G in which our gravitational action is going to look like the Einstein action. So if we do this, then we can go through, it's just a change in the metric, and it's actually a very straightforward change. You're just multiplying it by number. So we can go through and calculate our new connection and our new curvature. And we find that, unsurprisingly, what we get is that the curvature of G tilde is related to the curvature of G by some scaling factor and derivatives of the conformal factor. So we set, we're going to choose our omega so that it's going to cancel this e to the sigma in the action. If we choose that, So our root g, root g tilde is going to pick up four powers of omega times root g. So that's the first bit. And then our r tilde, we know, is omega to the minus 2, r minus 6, this box omega term. And so if I input what my omega is, I find that I get exactly what I needed. I've got an e to the minus sigma there to cancel the e to the plus sigma. I've got the standard Einstein Ricci term. And now the derivatives of my scalar field have come back into play. So previously in the Jordan frame, it didn't look like you had dynamical terms for the scalar field, although you did once you thought it through about varying the action. But here, having gone to this Einstein frame, you now explicitly pick up kinetic terms. So having gone to something in which gravity looks more familiar, you need a way in, to incorporate the dynamics of the scalar. So finally, we're going to rescale um, our scalar field, so it looks canonical. I'll just write down our metric because we've done quite a bit with it.
So this is what we finally get once we rescale. Now we can see explicitly what we have is our gravity. So this is spin two, if you like, massless. Everything's massless here. This is our scalar and our vector piece. So you can see how we've taken a five-dimensional metric, which would be, as you would imagine, a five-dimensional sort of gravity in five dimensions would be like a massless spin two mode, which is five degrees of freedom. Here we've reduced this now down to the, the sort of massless sector in four dimensions, which is four dimensional graviton, spin, spin two, two degrees of freedom, scalar, one degree of freedom, and a vector two polarization states again. So we haven't, we've, you know, that's just doing a little bit of accounting there to double check that we haven't done anything silly. The numbers of degrees of freedom are still the same, you know, in terms of propagation. What we're not seeing here are all the other states which depend on psi. Okay. So just a couple of comments here. L is the sort of size of the internal dimension. Uh, I suppose it depends on the zero phi, but the reason that I put that in, and obviously, traditionally, when kaluza klein theory got picked up again in the 80s as part of doing supergravity and compactifications down to four dimensions, people tended to sort of set g equal one, and you wouldn't have seen this L because it was assumed all of these dimensions were compactified sort of at the Planck scale, and so that everything was at the same, um, same size. But now we've sort of got as we'll see when, if we look at, you know, looking at um, large extra dimensions or warped compactifications, we've got this notion that maybe the extra dimension can have some different size. And so you can see this was why I wanted to keep my gravitational constant in, because four-dimensionally, four it's going to be equal to G5 over L. And so you can see that you know, again, four-dimensionally, Newton's constant has dimensions length squared. In, in arbitrary dimension, Newton's constant has dimensions L to the d minus 2. So obviously, it's dimensionally correct. But you can also see that this is a way of changing the scale, changing Newton's constant across different numbers of dimensions. So it's saying that our four-dimensional gravitational constant is a derived quantity. And it's just a means of changing scale scales. So what I want to just finish off by commenting on is talking about black hole solutions. We've already talked about general black hole solutions and general numbers of dimensions, but in the, ca the cases that we were talking about were where our black hole could depend on whichever dimensions we wanted. In the context of Kaluza-Klein theory, the black holes must only really have geometry in the four-dimensional space. So that's somewhat more restrictive. Let me just uh, talk about this a little bit. So when we do Kaluza-Klein theory, we compactify our extra dimension. And what this does, in a sort of slightly sneaky way, is it introduces an actual rest frame. So we have here, if this is our um, t and our extra dimension, psi, so we can imagine here, what we do is we identify psi with psi plus l at constant time. So we're identifying this point with this point. Now if I do a Lorentz boost in my extra dimensions, so here's some T primed and some Psi primed, then 
I'm no longer identifying uh, in the T prime, psi prime frame, I'm not identifying psi primed at constant T. I'm actually making a bit of a different identification. So my in the in the prime frame, it's still an identification, but it now involves both the time and the spatial coordinate. And so what that means is that we've actually introduced a rest frame, and the rest frame is the one in which we identify a constant time. So let's see what that does to black holes. So we already saw that adding, tacking on an extra flat dimension to Schwarzschild gave us a black string. So we know how to, to, to write Schwarzschild in this kaluza klein theory. So the black string was going to be, let's imagine it's a black string in the T prime, psi prime frame. So obviously nothing happens to the, um, the sort of space transverse to the black hole. But what I'm doing here now is I've replaced T prime with the Lorentz transform in terms of T and psi. So I'm saying I'm boosting and then identifying. So this would be the metric that I get. So let's now just rewrite it. And when we do that, what we have to remember is that we're trying to write our metric in that form. So we have to make sure that we pull together our, we complete the square in terms of the uh, psi angle. Mm -hmm. Well, when we, when we talked about the black string last week, it was the Schwarzschild black hole, so it was the hole in four dimensions, translated into the extra dimension, yeah. So if I look at what my g psi psi is, I get that. So the only thing that's slightly unexpected is the denominator, if you like, in the GTT, and that's simply because you have to complete the square on the psi side, and so that's sort of where that term comes from. So you can sort of double check that, but that's how, that's how it all sort of pans out. So it looks a bit different, as advertised. I said it was boosting, then compactifying was different from compactification first. And so what we want to do is just change coordinates to make it look a bit more familiar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of rewrite my radial coordinate so that I'm going to take care of this shift here. And then I'm going to, this cross term, this looks like if you look at the a mu, you've got a number over r at large r. So it looks like q over r dt. Okay, so I'm going to try and pick that out by defining a charge. Okay. 
So there you can see that by defining that as my charge, that is my new um, radial variable. I get something that looks like an electric potential for an electric charge. So I can also read off my uh, scalar field. So now if I go to my um, Einstein frame metric, so this is ds4 squared, you see I get something that really looks quite different now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pull these, you know, use this term together. I'm going to call this 2gm hat. And so that I can see that I've still got the Schwarzschild potential in there. But what I also have are additional potentials that come from the charged particle. So I, I can take an extremal limit, just like we had for uh, Rice and Nordstrom. And the extremal limit in this case, and this is something that sort of crops up quite a lot, is actually taking the limit as v goes to 1. So in other words, we boost the black hole faster and faster, and we keep m hat constant. So v goes to 1, m hat fixed. So we're letting our original black string become lighter and lighter. So the original mass parameter becomes lighter and lighter as we boost it more and more until the limit you can think of is as letting the, the mass of the black hole go to zero whilst its speed goes to the speed of light. So it's kind of, that's a non-trivial limit. And so that's our extremal limit, and then V goes to one. And it's a, it's a singular extremal limit, but you can sort of see as, um, as V goes to one, you kind of get this you can sort of see it's going to become singular because this is now going to become 1 minus uh, Q over R. And, um, well, I guess our, our mass, these two terms also kind of become the same. So there's a very sort of similar pattern to the metric. Yep. M hat is fixed. And M hat is the parameter that's appearing in the, it's, it's the rescaled mass that stays constant. So you can see that 1 minus v squared is blowing up, but, so that's why you have to set m goes to 0. So I just want to finish off by looking at a magnetic black hole, which is rather different, and actually has some quite a nice piece of mathematics in it. So a magnetic black hole, you would expect... that our, your two form, your Maxwell two form, would look like d theta d phi, sine theta d theta d phi. So let's just, you know, sort of see where that takes us. So be, I'm just going to sort of tell you what it does. So if I write down my gauge potential, <clears throat> I'm going to choose a gauge potential that's regular at the North Pole. You can do a gauge transformation to make it regular at the South Pole if you want by making it minus uh, 1 minus cos theta. Now, the solution that you get, let's put it over here.
So Q is basically related, as you can see, to the square root of R plus R minus. So I've written it in this way simply because, you know, I want to discuss the extremal limit in a more um, sort of fashion that makes it more obvious what's going on. So you're, you know, you're, this time you're adding in some different sort of charge. This looks more topological over here. And this is what you get if you actually solve the vacuum Einstein equations. Now, the reason I said this was interesting is there's a couple of sort of features that uh, crop up. So here, I think you looked at the magnetic monopole in Reisner and Nordstrom? No? No? Okay. Yes. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. So, so I'm simply going to point out a couple of things. This is a kaluza klein black hole. You can reduce it to four dimensions using the description that I've just given. You'll get a four-dimensional metric. But I want to discuss the five-dimensional solution because, as I said, there's something interesting happens in the extremal limit. So there's just two things I want to say about this. One is about the gauge potential, and one is about the extremal limit. Now, in this case, this gauge potential A here is part of the geometry. It's not a separate gauge field. So our gauge field A and so must, our metric must be regular at the poles. So we really don't want to have a singularity sticking out along the South Pole. I've explicitly constructed A to be regular at the North Pole. Now, if I wanted to write an A which was regular at the South Pole, I would have written, as I said, minus Q into 1 plus cos theta d phi. So that's giving me two alternatives, two, two coordinate patches for, my, for writing down my gauge potential. So how do you get between these two coordinate patches? So, so I guess there's a sort of break here. Um, So to get between these two coordinate patches, I have to make a transformation. I have to go, I've got a psi coordinate in the north patch, psi primed in the south patch, and all I do is add a multiple of phi. But, of course, both phi and psi are periodic, and my psi goes with psi plus L in terms of the periodicity of psi, and so that tells me that 4 pi q has to be quantized. So this indicates a quantization of charge. So this is actually goes back to uh, some, the reason that Dirac first thought about magnetic monopoles, so just monopoles in standard electromagnetism, where he sort of looked at or theorized what if, what if there was a magnetic monopole he looked at the wave functions of electrons propagating in the background of an electric of a magnetic monopole and deduced that if there was even one magnetic monopole in the universe, then there would be problems with the wave function of electrons unless electric charge was quantized. So it's kind of one of these sort of fun little facts that... Um, if you have a single magnetic monopole, electric charge absolutely has to be quantized. So here, the other thing I wanted to say was extremal limit is clearly R plus equals R minus. By the way, I've constructed it. Yep. Zero. 
No, because you're moving at the speed of light. So, in fact, this is a common trick. You see this in other places in relativity where you take a massless limit but boost to the speed of light in such a way that the energy of what you're doing remains finite. That's the notion. Yeah. So the energy is finite of what you're doing. It's really because of this strange thing of going, you know, to a null limit. It's, yeah, it's sort of, I think, you, you know, you wouldn't want to jump straight there. It's something that you, you understand as a limiting procedure. I'm not sure if you jump, you know, it's, it's sort of one of those. Uh, so anyway, let me just quickly finish. Otherwise, the guy's going to come in and start <laughs> taking everything down. <laughs> Sorry, I just said you're going to come in and start. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a question. Okay, this is the extremal limit. Um, right, so you can see that if I take r plus equals r minus, my dt squared is now just a flat direction. And so what I've got is a four-dimensional, non-trivial Euclidean manifold with an extra time direction. And if I now look, at it, it looks a curved manifold. It looks like something might happen as R goes to R+. Plus. Um, I'm going to do my usual trick. I'm going to redefine my radial coordinate. And then what I get near, of course, uh, R plus is this. Now, it may not be obvious. This is obvious, you know, this is clearly a sort of S2. And this here is another S1, but it has a little twist. What this actually is, this, this part, is S3 in Euler angles. So what this metric looks like in the extremal limit is actually completely non-singular as R goes to R+. Plus. And... Here is our S2. Here's our extra dimension. So think of it as like chain mail. And what you're doing is you're stitching your chain mail on over your two sphere, but you're doing it with a twist. And so you, what you can think of it as is your chain mail goes over the upper hemisphere, your chain mail goes on the lower hemisphere. As you identify across the equator, you're identifying with one of these coordinate twists. And what you see is, so as you start, you identify doing, you know, a little bit more of a twist. By the time you've gone round the equator, you've done a whole twist. So what you don't have is, you don't have S2 cross S1. You've actually built an S3 by fibering your S1 in a non-trivial fashion. So this is an example of what's called a hop fibration. And it's kind of a cool little mathematical feature and it means that this, you know, this manifold is, you know, really sort of interesting little solution. Thank you, and sorry. <laughs>